choose your own adventure, where we get to control our stories and our circumstances. And look, if we don't like the way the plot is unfolding, we can just stop reading and flip to a different page. But there's a reason why you find those books in the fiction section. Because it doesn't take very long. You're not very many chapters into this life when you realize it's not how real life works. Someone put it this way, all of us start off thinking our story will be written a certain way, but it never quite goes how we had planned. But even when your story doesn't go as planned, even when things don't go how you hope they would, you can still believe in the redemption of God, that God can redeem anything. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Grace Street Church. We're glad to have you here either in person or uh, taking a look at our streaming or our video later on online. And what a beautiful day it is. It's, it's spinning a little bit of precipitation, but I like to say it's just like God's grace falling like rain. It's a renewal process. And we start off this brand new season this week, fall. So we get to uh, start a new season, and hopefully in the year 2020, that will bring good things in this fall compared to what we had at the start of the other two seasons <laughs> this year. So it's been a little bit of a challenge, and so we welcome everyone here today, and we just call God's blessing upon you. Uh, we have Orange Track Racing coming up in a couple of weeks because, yeah, we're going to be already into October already, so uh, we're going to have some more racing coming our way. And kind of wanted to preview some of the things that we're thinking about for our mission and outreach for the Thanksgiving time period. Uh, we're looking to do possibly a dinner here. We're working to get all that approved and get all the, those kind of things done. And possibly some kind of Christmas program as well. So uh, a lot of fun things that we have on the planning calendar right now and, and look forward to uh, your participation in that as well. So. Uh, we once again thank you and, and welcome you here. Today is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today's call to worship comes from Psalms 130, verse 7. And it goes, Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. And it's believed that King Hezekiah actually wrote that psalm. And it was to have the people of Israel change their perspective and to reestablish their hearts, reestablish that relationship in their hearts with God, and to call them back into the promises that God had made to them. And the Israelites at that point in time were struggling with doubt, and they were distracted from their calling that God had put on their hearts. And, and you know, we look at that and we look at what all is going on in our lives today. And we look at all the distractions and everything that we're faced with. And it's, it's good to have a reminder too that we can get caught up with all the stuff that's going on in our lives. And the daily basis and those challenges and tasks. And in my sermon last week, I talked about that and how we're going to be tested daily, and it seemed like I kind of spoke it into existence this last week. Everything was going on, and we, we were faced with challenges and tests. But really, truly, it's how we face those challenges. Where do we turn? You know, do we turn to ourselves, or do we turn to God? And that's what King Hezekiah was saying in this psalm, was make sure that you turn your hearts to God. Because for the Lord, he has unfailing love for us and full redemption. So 2 Corinthians says in 4, 17 and 18, For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now, but rather fix our eyes on the things that we can't see. But the things that we cannot see will last forever. The things we can see are only temporal. And I think this is really truly where we need to kind of focus 
ourselves because 2020 has really, really been a distraction. So I believe this, that our faith is our basis of hope. And hope ensures our faith. So as I was preparing this last night, that thought came popping into my head. That our faith is the basis of hope and our hope ensures our faith. And our faith in God and His Word and in the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus, will bring us to that salvation. And it'll bring us through when we seem to be lost on our path. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Father God, we come before you today and we just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather together. We thank you for the message that you've laid on Pastor Terry's heart that he will share with us today. And we ask that it would bless us as he gives that message. That we would see the hope that we would see your unfailing love in his message today. Lord, we praise you and thank you for the tests that you gave us this past week. And we know, Lord, that there's going to be tests and challenges that we face in the coming week and coming months and through the rest of our lives. But through you, we have hope. Help us to ensure our faith stays strong. And we focus on the love that you share with us each day. Thank you, Father God. Give us open ears to hear today, open eyes to see your glory. And put on our hearts your message and your word today, that it will live and dwell in us each and every day of our lives. Amen. makes you want to start singing with it, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, it is a beautiful day, and it is the day that the Lord hath made. This morning our scripture uh, is going to be from Romans chapter 8, so if you have your Bibles with you, you have your phones with you, go ahead and pull those out if you're at home, go over to the bookshelf, grab your Bible, dust it off, open it up, and uh, Let's just start by reading that, and then we'll get into the message today. So from Romans 8, verses 22 through 25, it says, For we know that all creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us, as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something we don't need, hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Now, we are in week two of our series, I Still Believe. And the question we're discussing throughout this series is this. How do we allow circumstances to shape our beliefs about God? Last week, we learned that there, um, where we place our hope determines by whose strength we will endure this life. And it determines how we will engage in this life. And it determines what we will sacrifice for true life. Pastor Mark also talked about the fact that where our hope is placed is the foundation of a belief that perseveres in all things. It is how we endure and persevere when our surroundings would beg us to throw in the towel. And as I was writing this, I did, did not click pop into my head, but I immediately just thought of poor Job and the circumstances that he went through and the things that he went through and, and the troubles that he went through. And I think about my friends and I think about my family and the things that they've gone through. My, my daughter had 
uh, a positive test for COVID-19 several weeks ago and then viral pneumonia after that. Uh, Pastor Mark and his wife Lori have been in and out of the hospital with parents recently. I had shoulder surgery a couple weeks ago. I'm not wearing the sling today. We'll see how that works out for me. I may be groaning because of that. Okay, bad joke. That's almost as bad as a good dad joke. Um, but there's a lot of things that are going on. And so in this sermon, we just, we're going to just uh, see one example of God redeeming our past. Because no, it doesn't matter where we've been from, what we've done, God redeems us always. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation, maybe a meeting, uh, sitting in church, watching a silent countdown, been at home, been any number of places, and out of nowhere, all of a sudden you hear, <laughs> your stomach growls. And it's really, it's a lot louder than that. It's really loud, and everybody hears it, and everybody looks at you like, don't you know? Problems? It just all of a sudden growls and groans for no reason. You had breakfast, you had lunch, whatever the case may be. You may even had a snack, but it decided it was going to growl. And I think if there was a worldwide study released that it would reveal that uh, hunger pangs come nine out of ten times at the most inconvenient of all times. And it may be when your boss has just asked everybody stops in a meeting, or even worse, you're sitting with a friend and they're pouring your heart their heart out to you. And you're doing you're you're doing really good. You're listening, you're hearing what they said, you're you're empathizing with them, and all of a sudden Almost always, it's the worst possible time that it happens. And anyone who has experienced this knows that no amount of squirming or talking louder or distracting or just plain trying to ignore that it even happened can, you pre can prepare you for it. It just happens. But as I said before, God redeems because the embarrassment from things like your stomach growling and groaning serves as a great illustration for today's message. And so let's go back to that passage from Romans 8. I'm going to reread those first two verses, 22 and 23. It says, For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. Now was it just me, or as you listen to that passage, did you hear the word groan? And does it sound like an odd word to hear? It was to me. Especially the very first time I read that. And I think this word should stand out because the action itself stands out. So if we go back to that illustration just a few moments ago, if it didn't serve as a sufficient enough example of what groaning sounds like, then just listen for it when I make this announcement today. Today's sermon... Now, Mark, he would usually just tell you it'd be about two or three hours long. I'm only going to go a half hour longer. Now, some of you may have just gone through oh, Jeez. Oops, it slipped out out loud. Or you may have just thought it, right? That inner groaning when something you don't expect to happen happens guy who cut you off on the way to church this morning and you went, huh? Why? Those things just pop in your head without any warning. Just like that stomach growl will do. Well, the word groaning is used two times in these two verses and next week 
we will talk about the third time and is used in reference to the Holy Spirit. But we're not going to go any further with that because I know Mark's got a great message for next week, so we'll leave that right there for you just to think about. But the reason I want to focus on this word this week is because the very action of this word, I believe it is not only an act of faith, but a descriptor of the faithfulness of God. So when your stomach growls and groans, it serves as a signal. It's signifying that something's not as it should be. It's your body's way of saying, there's something wrong, there's something off here. Uh, something that doesn't make sense, and the only way to fix it is to do something outside of yourself. Now, maybe it is because you were hungry. Maybe you forgot to eat before you went to work or before you came to church. Or maybe there's something else going on, and you need to see a doctor and have it looked into, because maybe there's something going on that you need attending to. But it's something outside of yourself that needs to happen. And the same is true with us when it comes to suffering. See, when suffering comes, our acknowledging that it should not be so is our body's recognition that God did not design a world for suffering. Now, God did not design us uh, to endure pain. And before I, I came up here this morning, Diane goes, are you okay? You look a little white. Yeah. Pain will do that too. I said, no, it's okay. It's a good illustration for the sermon today. But God didn't design it. When he designed the Garden of Eden, he designed a place of perfection. It is only because of the fall that we end up in the world that we're in today. And whenever it says, well, really, God allow this or that, that. We live in a fallen world. That's just part of it. Eternity in heaven is where that perfection will come back. But how about this? When your heart drops as you're hearing the news. You know, recent, just a few weeks ago, we were talking about 9-11. And everybody was reminiscing about how their heart just dropped when they saw the planes crashing. Or... It's, it can be more than that. When, when you're suffering uh, and you're overwhelmed with emotions, maybe it's a bad breakup or a bad divorce you're going through. You, you just kind of shrink into yourself and you don't want anything to do with anybody. You don't want to eat. Your, your appetite is gone. And you just don't want anything. That's your body telling you that something is off. And have you ever thought about our groaning and our grieving and our heartache and our bodily response to the suffering is being a tool by which our trust in the faithfulness of God grows. I believe that this genuine awareness of our suffering can serve as, as an acknowledgement that things are not the way God intended. Not only that, but it can serve as an act of surrender knowing that something outside of ourselves must fix the state that we are in. So acknowledging the suffering of the world can actually be the way that we foster greater faith that God truly is working all things out for our good. That God is moving in the direction of redemption and restoration. So today, let's talk about how to allow your circumstances to expand your trust in God's faithfulness. And as I said before, there are two kinds of groaning, and we want to discuss both of those today. These two expressions reveal distinct significance about God's faithfulness and his redeeming work in our lives. So the first one, that first expression, is the groaning of all creation. So verse 22 says, For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So this first expression of groaning seen here, this groaning of the entire creation can't be overlooked because what Paul is saying is that all creation is currently aware of its tainted state. And 
when you think about that, it's not just we as Christians that realize that things are off. Non-believers both see that too. And, and people are, are wanting things to change. People are needing things to change. But we know as Christians there's only one way for that to happen. That is by God's love. And we've been talking about that for a long time. We've been talking about unity and bringing people together for a long time. So, Romans 8.22 also reveals to us that the awareness creation has of its bondage. It's aware that there's something wrong that only someone outside of itself can fix. Going back to the illustration. When we're feeling that way, something needs to happen outside of ourselves. So rather than the flourishing that the garden was intended for, creation has tasted death. And it groans for life because sin entered the garden. It groans for restoration to its original state. So as Paul compares the world, waiting for God to come in and turn things around, with a lady having a child. He says it's like labor pains. The whole creation is groaning like in the pains of childbirth. Now I've heard that there are a couple experiences that are the most painful to experience. One, obviously, I can't experience because I'm not a woman and that is childbirth. I have no idea what that I know that there was a comedian once that said it's like taking your lower lip and stretching it up and over the top of your head. Not going to try that either. The other one I have not had any experience with, and I know some of you may have. In fact, I know some of you definitely have. And that's a kidney stone. They both sound excruciatingly painful to me. And... No. I'm not in. But how people process pain individually is very different. Wouldn't you say? We all handle pain differently. Last night, sitting on the couch, I had stretched my arm out, trying to get a little bit of stretching into it so I can move it a little bit further. And I brought it back in after a little while, and all of a sudden I had this intense pain. I told Diane on a scale of 1 to 10, it was a 40. I immediately asked for an ice pack, and when she got back from there, I said, go grab one of those Percocet. I'm going to take one of those bad boys. She went, she came back, she put it in my hand, I said, mm, nah, let's skip it and go with just some Tylenol instead. I'm not one for the narcotics like that. But I screamed out in pain. Um, we had the windows open because it was cooling down outside, so I'm sure people were wondering what was going on in our house. And, you know, pain hurts. Um, didn't cry. Sometimes pain's bad enough that you cry, right? We all process it differently. And maybe it's not a physical pain, maybe it's the pain in the heart. And how we process that heart pain. Is different for everyone. Now, going back to our examples, it's possible that after giving birth, you might hear a mother say, you know, let's do that again. Okay. But I've never heard someone who passes a kidney stone say, may God bless me with another one. Why? Because while the pain is intense for both, the outcomes are very different for both. One leads to a beautiful child. And the other one, eh, it just leads to a stone. Remember what Paul said as a promise for the believer in our verse from last week. Romans 8, 18. This would be the NIV translation. It says, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's why Paul used childbirth instead of a kidney stone. How we believers see suffering 
is so very different from unbelievers. Because we know what's on the other side. We have that hope. We know what's coming. We know the glory that is to come. C.K. Chesterton described this creation by saying, it's kind of like living in the remains of a shipwreck. We find many treasures, but clearly things are not as they are meant to be. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 and 57 from the NIV says it this way, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, we recognize that sin leaves a sting, and we do feel that wound. But the battle has been won. This present suffering is real, but it's like the pains of childbirth. It's a suffering that is leading to something beautiful. It's a suffering that isn't wasted. It's a suffering that points to a Savior. And it's a suffering that God will be faithful to redeem. Bertrand Russell was a philosopher in the early 20th century. An outspoken atheist, he wrote a book called Why I Am Not a Christian. And when he was 81 years old and his health was deteriorating, he was interviewed by a British broadcasting station and the interviewer asked him this. He said, now that you're coming to the end of your life, what do you have to hang on to when death is so close? And Russell responded in a very honest but also very hopeless way. He said this, I have nothing to hold on to but grim, unyielding despair. How awful. Now, I appreciate his honesty. And it, it does take a certain amount of intellectual honesty to essentially say, this is the reality of my life. I've put my hope in this world. Everything. Everything that I put my hope in is here. And all of that is being stripped from me. And it's all going to be gone. We don't have hope. That's But if your hope is in heaven, then the suffering of this life is merely like the pains of childbirth. But if your hope is not in heaven, then life can feel a little bit like the passing of a kidney stone. So that leads us into our second point this morning. It says the second expression is our inward growing. Romans 8, 23 and 25 from the NIV tells it this way. It says, not only so, but we ourselves, who had the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it. So today we've received our adoption as children of God. Yet we still await the promised inheritance of complete transformation. Genesis 3 reveals the curse of man, and Revelation tells us that the curse will be removed. In fact, in chapter 21, verse 4 of Revelation, it says this, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. But till this time, Paul says that creation waits with eager expectation. Paul is saying, in our flesh, when suffering comes, we must realize that this is not the end of the story. We live in between what was and what is to come. Bob Benson, in his book, See You at the House, which is about their stories examining events that gave evidence of the presence of God in our daily lives. He talks about a conversation he had with a friend of his. His friend's name was simply W.T. 
who had had a heart attack recently. And this is how, what Bob writes. He, he writes, uh, well, how did you like your heart attack? It scared me to death, almost. Would you like to do it again? No. Would you recommend it? Definitely not. Does your life mean more to you now than it did before? Well, yes. You and Nell have always had a beautiful marriage, but are you closer now than ever? No question, much closer. How about that new granddaughter? Do you hold her more tightly? Yes, I sure do. Do you have new compassion for people, a deeper understanding and sympathy? see, that's just what played out in Bob's mind. What really happened was this. He asked W.T., he said, how do you, you like your heart attack? W.T.'s answer? Silence. Now, neither Bob nor I would tell you to rush out and have a heart attack, or, like we talked about earlier, a kidney stone. But I don't want you to miss God's faithfulness in the story. God specializes in redeeming the darkest moments because that is the gospel message. Have you ever been asked, if you could go back in time and change the, your life, what would you change? I wouldn't change a thing. Yes, have I grieved and groaned and moaned and cried out to God because if I had listened to him in the beginning, I wouldn't be celebrating almost 20 years in ministry. I would be celebrating nearly 40 years in ministry. If I had listened to God at that time, would I have learned the lessons that I learned along the way? Would I have the things that I have now? I don't know. But I tell you what, I wouldn't give up Amanda, I wouldn't give up Marissa, I wouldn't give up Carissa or any of the rest of the family for anything. I wouldn't give up Diane for a thing. I would always be happy to live my life over the exact same way I did before. Because I was taught so much through it. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, in the first part of verse 10, and this is from the Living Bible, so it's a little bit different translation than maybe you're used to hearing, but it says this, For God sometimes uses sorrow in our lives to help us turn away from sin and seek eternal life. Now, a lot of you could just say, but say amen to that. God uses sorrow in our lives. And many of you would agree with this. You would say that what brought you to Jesus was one of the worst things that maybe ever happened to you. But one of the worst things that happened to you became one of the best things that happened to you. Because in that chapter, you met Jesus. You can fill this stage with people who would say, I was in the chapter titled Divorce. And my husband or my wife said they didn't love me anymore. They did not want to be married. It's the worst thing that happened to me, but I met Jesus in that moment. And we could put people up on the stage who would say, the worst day of my life is when the doctor looked across at me and said the word terminal. It was the worst day of my life. But it was the best day of my life because it was the chapter that I met Jesus. And I've heard people of all walks, and, and even inmates in prison, who say the worst day of their life was when they stood before a judge and the judge said, guilty, here's your sentence. It was the worst day of their life, but it was the best day of their life because they went to prison and they met Jesus. They were brought to Jesus. If you only hear one thing today, I want you to hear this. God's redemption is not in the absence of suffering, but in the midst of it. This is what God does. He takes all things, if we let him, and does a redeeming work in them. 
It is in God's nature to redeem all things for his good. So when we look at the cross, we see that God has redeemed suffering as a gateway to true living. He proves faithful even to the point of death. And whenever you are at it today, wherever you're at, I pray that you would begin to open your eyes to believe that even in your situation, God is faithful. I pray that you would have fresh eyes to see the groaning in your soul as a sign of a need for something outside of yourself rather than a sign of God's absence. I pray that you would trust that he is even now, right where you are, redeeming the darkest spaces of your life that seem empty, broken, and dead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for every person that is with us today, both in person and online. We thank you for those that will be listening and watching to this message later. We thank you for our own testimonies of your faithfulness and how you have redeemed us. Every one of us has a story to tell of what you have done and who you are. Help us to take all that we have learned during these times and apply every truth to our hearts. Give us the compassion and boldness to share what we have been given so that others may know you too. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry. So one of the things that was common here with the passages that Pastor Terry brought us in Romans today and in through the cult of worship as well is that we will all have challenges and we will all have pain and we will all have suffering. And as we come to, to look at that pain and the suffering that we have, what we need to do is focus on that hope focus on our faith because it's with that suffering that it builds our character it builds who Christ wants us to be it builds that faith that we have so we can look upon our time right now and we're we go to be reminded of the suffering that Christ did for us in taking on the sins of the world taking on the sins of man all of them. And he suffered on the cross. We, we don't wear a cross to just have a piece of jewelry hanging around our neck. That's not what it's for. This symbolizes that Christ died and suffered for me. And through that action on the cross, I am privileged to have something. And so we have to have hope and we have to have faith in that promise today. And so as we take this time of communion today, I want you to think about that and think about that suffering. Think about the promise and that hope that we have through our faith. And that we have salvation through that act of suffering for Christ. See, that, that pain that he had was temporary was temporary but it lasts a lifetime he took on our suffering he took on our pain he took on our sins and sacrificed himself out of love as I said earlier today he has unfailing love and full redemption that's our call to worship so on the night that he was given up, he took bread and he broke the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you, take and eat. And likewise, he took the cup and after he blessed it, he said, this is my blood shed for you, a new covenant between God and This is my blood shed for you. This is the symbols of the suffering of Christ and the salvation and the promise.
promises of hope and faith that we have today. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. So for those of you who can't be with us here today, if you would like to share in our communion, please drop us a note. Give us a call. We'd be more than happy to get communion service to you here so that you can share in this meal. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord, whose love is bigger and big enough to surround the entire earth, fill our hearts today full of hope. Bolster our faith and lift us up. Edify us in you. Lord, build us up today so that we would have the strength and we would have the faith and we can count on your unfailing love and full redemption to bring us through any suffering or trial that we have today. Thank you, Lord, for those promises you give us in Jesus' name. Now it's time for our praises and prayers, our time for prayers of the people. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. And I know this week has been tough for a lot of you, and so there's a lot of prayer that we need. And, uh, We'll start with Terry for his shoulder, we're going to pray for that, and for Harold, and for your mother, Diane, right? She's doing much better. Is she doing much better? She oh, good. Yesterday, she got a brand new, brand new picnic. Oh my gosh, what a blessing, yes. <laughs> and she's doing well, how she's how's... She's doing better. Oh, good. She's Absolutely. still got a ways to go, but she's doing so much better. Oh, good. Yeah. That's a blessing. How about Harold? Is Harold doing any better? Yeah, he's, he's coming along, so we go back in tomorrow for x-rays and to figure out when they're going to uh, mm -hmm. get in there and take the stent the kidney stone out. So. Oh, okay. Well, it's another, another harsh week for him, probably. Yeah, so we'll be praying for him. And um, so Richard, your sister Kim, still, we'll pray for her for her Alzheimer's. And Steve has a friend, Jake, and his wife. Uh, she's pregnant, and they think that the baby might have spinal bifida. So they're not sure, but um, we're going to pray for her. Is there anyone else that would like prayer at all today? Because I'm just going to lift it up as a, a mass prayer. <laughs> so let's go to God in prayer. Father God, I just praise your holy name. Please bring the Holy Spirit into this place. Rest upon everyone here and all those who are listening, all those who are in, uh, in need of prayer, with pain and suffering. And um, I just pray the blood of Jesus over all of us. For your blood covers everyone, Lord God. Not just one or two, but everyone. And your healing, healing power, will cover everyone on this earth. If we just ask in prayer that you heal us and, and that we will hear from you. And I want to thank you, God, for your love for us, for your everlasting just your everlasting love that you died on the cross to save us from our sins and to heal our bodies when we ask for you are a great God and you are a worthy God and your love is from everlasting to everlasting and we praise your holy name this morning in Jesus name This concludes our online broadcast right now of, of our service today. We invite you to come out for Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock and join us for our Bible study time that we have. We've got uh, our new Advent study that's going to be coming up here in a few weeks, which is a study by Max Lucado, and we're looking forward to that. It's brand new, just got released this week. 
and uh, it shipped. So I should be able to have that in my hands here so we can start reviewing it here shortly. So thank you for joining us here today. We look forward to you joining us again next week at 11 o'clock right here in person or online. May God bless you this week.